Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you with soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his goodly frame. Who can strip off his outer garments? Who would come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth, forth from his mouth. In his neck abides strength, and terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. For him, sling stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rattle of javelins. His underparts are like sharp potsherds. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think that the deep is to be white-haired. On earth, there is not his like, a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold, and the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Kezia, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. 
And in all the land, there were no women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. Thanks, Leah, very much for reading. Please keep Job open. We're going to be touring a few chapters today, but mostly those, just those last two. And since lots of us are tired, some of us have come off the back of a weekend away, we're going to start with an up-to-date contemporary illustration, modern film, Aladdin. I mean, I'm thinking of the 1992 one, but you can remember the 2019 one if that's more helpful. You'll probably know Aladdin. If you don't, don't worry, it's not a particularly complicated scene. There's a moment where the central character, Aladdin, turns to his love interest and says to her, do you trust me? Actually, it comes up a couple of times in the film in a quite significant way, but you can watch the film if you've not before to catch that another time. Uh, The the situation is that there's a big precipice behind him, and he's inviting her to step up with him, at one point uh, to jump, and at another point to step onto a magic carpet. Uh, But the question that he asks her, which we need to think about as we start this evening, do you trust me? It's a question for us because that is the question that, in a sense, God has been asking of us as we've worked through the book of Job over these last four weeks. Uh, We've been dipping into this book of Job just for four weeks. We've only had chance to skim the surface, but we've been hearing about this guy Job, a blameless and upright man who feared God and turned away from evil, but who faced horrible suffering, uh, the loss of his livelihood, of his family, of his health. And at the beginning of the book, he trusted God. He expressed that trust in this amazing Uh, this amazing statement, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. But throughout the rest of the book, we've seen him agonizing, wrestling with the contrast between the God he knows is good and the world that he sees is broken, Uh, a broken world that he simply cannot fathom. Indeed, actually, as Job summarized his case last week, he expressed that sense of our inability to fathom things. He talked about humanity's great insights, but the fact that we can't ultimately find wisdom in this broken universe. We cannot grasp the why, and we need to trust God with it. Several people came up to me, came up to me after last week and said how helpful they'd found those words of Job. How liberating to know that we're not expected to understand everything, that we can trust God with it. But for others of us, It simply made the book's encouragement to trust the Lord even harder. It's all very well knowing what we're supposed to do, but the harder the suffering that God has allowed us to go through, the harder it is to really trust him in it. In fact, that's Job's own experience. Even while he was able to express wonderful things in this book, he was still wrestling when we left him at the end of chapter Well, actually, chapter 31, if you read the rest of Job's summary speech, chapters 29 to 31, he mourns the loss of his former life, and he's challenging God over the justice of his suffering. It's all very well knowing that the Lord is trustworthy, but it's hard to believe. Do you trust me? We need something more than we've had so far. Job needed something more than we've had so far. If, as chapter 28 tells us, God is the only one with wisdom, then really we need to hear from him. And he has been conspicuously silent through most of this book. So it's thrilling now to get to these last few chapters of Job and to hear God's speeches. God at last speaking into the situation. And we'll focus in just a moment on the final two chapters. But before we do that, let me quickly just give a summary of what we've missed in between. You can see a structure of Job on the handout inside your sheets. Um, and we've, been, we've basically avoided this guy called Elihu, mainly because we haven't got time, but also because he's very confusing. Uh, he is another friend of Job's, but he's the only person that we don't get any official verdict on. And so commentaries get very uh, confused over what to do with him. I've struggled to work it out. Please tell me later uh, what you reckon about Elihu if you've been reading Job along with this series. I've rather rudely suggested on the handout that he's in the way Uh, Which is because if we finish chapter 28 longing to hear from God, and I think we do, the Lord alone has wisdom, then Elihu's speeches are just in the way of hearing God. He's a kind of interruption, a delay, a frustrating traffic jam just before we reach our destination. 
He delivers a confusing combination of some good stuff that seems to set up what God is going to say and some bad stuff that just echoes what Job's friends have already said. And each speech makes us even more eager to hear God himself, the clear words of God, the wisdom of God. And then finally, in chapter 38, verse 1, chapter 38, verse 1, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind out of the depths of the storm. And there, within the very center of Job's anguish, God speaks. And don't you want to hear what he has to say? If you've been with us through this series, aren't you desperate to know what God is going to say? If I were to stop right now, wouldn't you keep on reading? Here is the moment that God breaks in, breaks his silence, and tells Job what he and we need to hear. And it works. I flick over to page 536. You were probably there a second ago and I've made you move. Flick to the end of God's speeches and see that bit that Leah read for us just a moment ago and see how Job responds. 42 verse 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Or verse 5. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. God is extending his hand, Aladdin-like, if you, if, you look, if you will. He asks this question, do you trust me? And at the end of last week, Job was, like many of us, still struggling. But whatever God says in these closing speeches restores Job to the trust that he began with. Something about what God says enables Job to see. Something he knew before, which he'd heard with the ear, now he sees with the eye. It's as if he's saying, I knew it, but now I believe it. So what is it that Job has seen? That is what we're going to hopefully see this evening. And so strap in, grab a pen, you'll probably find it helpful if you want to take some notes, and let's look at what God says. Firstly, point one on the handout, which I'm going to change. Um, It is sort of the Lord has chaos and evil on his leash, but I'm going to suggest the Lord is bigger than you uh, is the title to go for. The Lord is bigger than you. God's first speech, chapters 38 and 39, is a stunning piece of poetry. I wish we had time for it. It's a list of rhetorical questions that challenge Job. It's as though God is asking the question, who do you think you are? Uh, Questions like, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Can you send forth lightnings? Do you give to the horse his might? And the Lord works through the canvas of his creation. And Job is left humbled. He ends up saying, I lay my hand over my mouth. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through that speech, but I think the images are vivid and quite straightforward. Let me encourage you to read it another time, if you haven't already. But God's second speech, chapters 40 and 41, they ask uh, a similar question, who do you think you are? But they take us a step forward. Where the first speech tours the natural worlds, the second speech focuses on two puzzling animals, Uh, 40 verse 15 introduces us to Behemoth, and 41 verse 1, Leviathan. If you look at the footnotes for either of those, you'll see that we don't entirely know what those two animals are. Uh, Some have have suggested a hippopotamus and a crocodile, but that doesn't really work. Uh, George Bernard Shaw is quoted as saying, if I'm complaining about suffering unjustly, it is no answer to say, can you make a hippopotamus? That doesn't quite work as as an answer from God. But more than that, the details don't work. So look at 41 verse 19. 41 verse 19, talking about Leviathan. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke. Verse 21, his breath kindles coals and a flame comes forth from his mouth. Anyone seen any fire-breathing crocodiles recently? I haven't. If you want to think more about them, let me encourage you to get hold of Piercing Leviathan by Eric Ortland. Um, he uh, explores uh, the identity of the animals and I think makes a compelling case. Uh, but to summarize what he says about this, let me suggest that God, in his second speech, has shifted his focus from the natural world and is now discussing symbols of cosmic chaos and evil that would have been familiar to Job, uh, using mythical symbols to make a true life point. Behemoth is slightly hard to work out. 
Um, but Leviathan is the one that gets more airtime, and he's actually easier to place because he gets mentioned elsewhere in the Old Testament. In fact, back in chapter 3, Job himself mentions Leviathan as a creature that might undo creation. Leviathan is a symbol of cosmic evil, the archenemy of God. He is God's adversary, or to put it another way, Satan. Satan, the devil, recognized in the Bible as a real being, who played a significant role at the beginning of Job, will remember, the one who caused Job to suffer, who has been absent for most of the intervening chapters, absent from the thinking of Job and his friends, but who returns now at the end of the book as he's dragged on stage by God in order for God to challenge Job with another set of rhetorical questions. 41 verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fishhook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Out comes this snarling beast, Satan, depicted as this sea monster, Leviathan. Before him, we're powerless. And maybe one of us, slightly more plucky, confident person, comes forward and tries to put a leash around his neck, and then the jaw snaps shut over his arm, and he loses it. Verse 3. Will he make any, uh, many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Of course not. Despite the fairy tales of doing a deal with the devil, Satan isn't negotiating with us. We're the ones cowering in the corner, unsure what to do with him. Verse 5, will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Are you going to treat him like a pet? Are you going to give him to your children? It's my nephew's fourth birthday this week. I've been struggling to work out what to get for him. Should I get him a Leviathan? Happy birthday, here you go. Have a fire-breathing crocodile, who is in fact Satan. I think I'd be pretty unpopular with my sister-in-law and everyone else in the family. Now, obviously, you won't do that. Verse 7. Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You won't do it again. No matter what weapons we might try to level against him, we can't get through his armor. Evil, Satan, a powerful beast that we cannot destroy. And so the the chapter goes on with this thrashing, snarling beast. And we're supposed to be terrified. I don't know if you noticed the repeated use of the word terror. In the days of Job, obviously they didn't have IMAX. This is as close as they got to a horror movie. And we are supposed to see that evil is a much more terrifying prospect than we realize. So often when we question God, we're saying, I could do better. I know better. I would do better. To quote Job, let the Almighty answer me. But God's response, maybe quite shocking to us that God would say this to Job, his response is to humble him. His speech, in fact, begins with the question, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? I will question you and you make it known to me. He's asking him, do you know? Can you control evil? Who do you think you are? And I think we need to hear that correction. Yes, the Bible gives us room to ask questions of God. Lots of room to pray in earnest heartache and anguish. To wrestle as Job does throughout this book. But when those questions morph into accusations, when we declare him in the wrong, let the Almighty answer me, God's response is one of humbling. Do you know? Can you? Who do you think you are? And yet God's response isn't just who do you think you are, it's also who do you think I am? The rhetorical questions throughout God's speeches aren't just about putting us in our place. They're also about revealing something of God. In chapters 38 and 39, his first speech, the the, the do you know questions, they've always got two answers. Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Can you send forth lightnings? Do you give to the horse his might? Uh, For us, no. But for God, yes. 
So also in this second speech, 41 verse 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? We can't, but God can. In fact, we, we as the reader have already seen him doing it. Back in chapter 1, Satan had to ask God for permission to do everything he did. And God replied, behold, Job is in your hand, but then he put on limits. Do not stretch out your hand against him. Spare his life. It was a clear demonstration that God's rope was tied through Satan's nose, that Satan was always on God's leash from the start. Verse 3, will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? He doesn't with us, but he does with God. He did with God. Remember him presenting himself before the Lord and having to plead with God to do what he did. And then crucially, verse 7, can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? We can't. We don't have the instruments to bring an end to evil. But excitingly, thrillingly, God does. Can you? No, of course not. Can God? Yes. Yes, he can. You can't tackle the problem of evil, but God can. I've quoted Christopher Ash a lot in this series. Here's one last quote from him. He says, the point of Job 41 is to make us tremble at the awesome power of the prince of evil. If we thought evil was bad, when we come face to face with Leviathan, we realize it is infinitely more frightening than we had thought. You cannot begin to take on the problem of evil, Job, and you know that. But I can, says the Lord. And I'm not going to pretend that's easy to get our heads around. In some ways, it's scary to think of God as in some way sovereign, in control over Satan, permitting Satan to cause all this evil and suffering. But wouldn't it be more scary to think of Satan as off the leash? Wouldn't it be more frightening if God's answers to these questions were all no? I can't. Evil in this world is powerful, terrifying, but God has it on a leash and he is able to defeat it. That's why when Leviathan gets dragged off the stage at the end of chapter 41, Job is able to respond. 42 verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He knows that God's purpose to defeat evil will come to pass. He always knew that God was mighty. He knew that God was in control, but it was hard to believe. Uh, verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now in the shining wake of Leviathan, having witnessed the terror of Satan and seen God's leash, having considered the awful horrors of evil, but God's mastery over it, now my eye sees you. The Lord has chaos and evil on his leash, and one day he will bring them to an end. And Job says, I knew it, but now I believe it. We are like Job in a world where Satan still thrashes his tail. Evil hasn't yet been brought to an end. And we might be tempted to rail against God. But God extends his hand, Aladdin-like, and asks us the question, do you trust me? Now, we don't know what he knows. We've got to make a decision. Do you trust him? God's speeches ask us, who do you think you are? And who do you think he is? Now, they put us in our place, but they also put God in his. The mighty creator God, the one who holds the leash of chaos and evil and the one who will destroy them both in the end. And one day that end will come, as we see in the end of the chapter. Point two more briefly, in the end, the Lord's vindication will come. 42 verse seven. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. As the book closes, we have confirmed what we were told at the start, that Job was in the right. 
True, during the course of the book, Job has said some things about God for which he's had to repent just now. But his suffering was not a consequence of his sin. He didn't experience his suffering as a punishment. His friends were wrong to say what they did. And as if to demonstrate that, Job gets a complete restoration. Verse 10, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he'd prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as, much as he'd had before. And back in chapter 1, he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys. They all get doubles in verse 12. And where he had tragically lost seven sons and three daughters... Verse 13 sees the gift of another seven sons and three daughters. In fact, verse 15, in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And then at the end, verse 16, he prolongs his days. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons, four generations, a sees offspring to several generations down and dies an old man and full of days. It doesn't undo the tragedy of chapters one and two. Satan's hand had brought horrific suffering for Job. And I guess that might leave us with some questions that this book doesn't deal with. There's lots more, the Bible says, on suffering. But the details of this closing section are clearly designed to match or even improve on the narrative introduction where Job was at the start. So here we get to the end of the book and the work of Satan is finally undone. A Job at the end of it all, vindicated. Here is Leviathan defeated and Job restored. Of course, we knew Job was right from the start. But if he'd been left in his suffering, we might have had some concerns. If Satan was still thrashing around at the end of this chapter, if Job was still destitute, we might wonder if God really does have the upper hand. And so this vindication of Job is, in a sense, the vindication of God. A reassurance that in the end, he will right every wrong. He will defeat Leviathan. It's not a promise that it will all get sorted in this life. It's not a promise that there's 14,000 sheep waiting outside for each of us. That'd be terrifying, wouldn't it? (laughs) But it is a picture of the vindication of God in eternity. When he establishes his perfect new creation... When Satan's work is ended once and for all, when the Lord rights every wrong and destroys all evil and suffering forever, here is a glimpse of the end. Most of the time when someone says, do you trust me? It sort of provokes me to think, oh, is there a reason I shouldn't? I'm inclined to say no. And maybe it's just I'm a doubtful person. Maybe I've just got some untrustworthy friends. But if someone stood on the edge of a precipice and said, do you trust me? I think I'd be fair enough for going, "Mm, not sure. But if you've got the chance to see someone in action, if you see them clearly up to the job, it's slightly easier to take their hand and say yes. And isn't that how these closing words in Job function? It's the vindication of Job, the vindication of God, a glimpse of the end, a case in point to help us to trust God in the context of our own suffering. And not a promise that it'll get sorted in this life, not an answer to all our questions, but a glimpse of what he will do in the end. In fact, if we read the book of Job in the context of the rest of the Old Testament, I wonder if this chapter even gives a clue of how he'll do it. In the Hebrew Bible, Job finds its place after Isaiah. And as lots of people have observed, there's loads of links between the two books. Even if you don't know anything about Isaiah, you might have spotted the connections between this final chapter and those words from Isaiah we read earlier on the other half of your handouts. Isaiah 53, all about the suffering of God's righteous servant, who in the end is vindicated, a chapter about the cross and resurrection. But doesn't Job point us in the same direction, even using some of the same language? Job is, after all, the story of a righteous man, the one whom God calls my servants four times in the space of two verses. The servant of God who experiences profound suffering. But out of the anguish of his soul, he sees. He says, now my eye sees you. And in the end, he makes intercession for the transgressors. He prolongs his days for another 140 years. He sees his offspring to the fourth generation. I wonder if you can see connections between Job 42 and Isaiah 53. 
Because if it's right, it's giving us a hint. Uh, Job 42 isn't just pointing us to God's vindication, but a hint, however faint, of how God will do it. In fact, even if that's not a deliberate connection, you can tell me another time. The cross is where the themes of Job find their fulfillment. As Job explores the theme of suffering, we see the work of Satan defeated through the suffering of a righteous servant. We're urged to look to God, to trust his defeat of evil, to expect his vindication in the end. And aren't those ideas fulfilled at the cross of Jesus? Job is a book that wrestles with the problem of evil and suffering, but it leaves us focused squarely on God and his purposes. And so as Christians, we're even better placed to embrace the lessons of this book. Like Job, we know that God will defeat Leviathan, but unlike Job, we know how he has dealt the mortal wound. Like Job, we live in a world of profound suffering where, where Satan still rides and we still have to respond to God before we've seen Satan's final defeat. But unlike Job, we have seen God deal the death blow through the suffering of his righteous servant, Jesus. As our theme verse put it, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them at the cross. With Leviathan on stage in chapter 41, we were given some reason to trust the Lord's. But when the cross comes into full view, we see the instrument of Leviathan's death and we're given even greater cause for faith. And so we're even more able than Job to respond as he did. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Of course, it's not going to be easy. We don't get to the end of this book and go, great, okay, I can face anything. Maybe we'd still struggle to respond as Job did at the beginning of the book. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Of course, it's not easy. But I do think this book of Job helps. We've only had a whistle-stop tour through it, but I hope it's given a hint of the kind of help that it's offering. I've certainly found it helpful to prepare me for whatever suffering I'll face in the future. Now, working through this book as a co-wrestler with Job, struggling to make sense of this broken world, we're made ever more aware of our own limitations, our ignorance, and our need to hear from God. And we get to the end of the book, and our gaze is fixed on the all-knowing, all-powerful God who holds Satan's leash, who has dealt Satan the decisive blow at the cross, and who ultimately will destroy evil forever. And so in the midst of the storm, God extends his hand, Aladdin-like, and he asks you the question, do you trust me? Let me lead us in prayer that we might all respond like Job. Almighty God, we praise you that you are the creator of the universe, that nothing is beyond you, that you are powerful, that you know everything, and that even where we are limited and ignorant, we can turn to you and trust you. And so we pray that for each and every one of us, whatever we have, uh, whatever we are due to face in the future, we pray that you would help us, uh, help us to draw near to you, help us to trust you, and help us to cling to the promise that you've given us in the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.